Hallelujah. I am so glad that I am in Augusta, Maine. I am so glad that I know your pastor. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now, <clears throat> any time that uh, he gets tired of you or you get tired of him, we'll take them in Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, our, our congregation loves Brother Stoops. And he always brings his harmonica. <laughs> yeah. And they said, be sure and remind him that when he comes out in December to bring your harmonica, praise God. Uh, I think he plays about as good as he preaches. Amen. But he preaches pretty good too. How many loves the Lord here tonight? Anybody can prophesy when things are going good. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to get a raise on your job. All right. Let's try that again. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're going to get a bitter, bigger raise than you're expecting. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, uh, I was preaching a revival uh, in San Bernardino, California. And uh, first night of that revival, I told the folks, I said, uh, we're going to have more than 100 people get the Holy Ghost in this revival. I didn't get a single amen. And five weeks later, we had 98 had received the Holy Ghost up to that point. And... Uh, this real big, big-nosed Italian fella walked up to me and he said, he said, Brother Corman, I believe we're going to have 100 people get the Holy Ghost. I said, get behind me. I said, it's easy to believe when we've already had 98 get the Holy Ghost. I said, where was you at five weeks ago? Anybody can believe it when we're on the verge of it. But I'm going to tell you what, I feel... There is a spirit of prophecy in this house. And the first thing I'm going to prophesy is uh, you're going to smile before the service is over. Amen. Secondly, I believe and, and I feel a spirit of prophecy that this church is going to double in one single revival. Hallelujah. When I went to Wichita, Kansas, we had 20 people, and they all sat on the fat back four rows of the congregation, and all the empty pews between me and them. And I never will forget, on August the 7th, 1977, I walked to the pulpit on Sunday night, the first Sunday I was there, and they all sat on the back four rows, they were depressed, they were beaten down, uh, they were angry, they were mad, they were bitter. Uh, our church had gone through three splits in a six-month period of time, and uh, they was about to all walk out and call it quits, and uh, they elected me, a 27-year-old young preacher, as their pastor. And my first sermon that I preached was entitled, How Far Can You See From Where You're Sitting?, When Abraham and Lot separated, then God said, Abraham, lift up thine eyes from the place where thou art to the north, south, east, and west, and I'm going to give you all of this land. And I said, let me tell you what you're seeing. You're seeing depression. Uh, you're seeing defeated. Uh, you're seeing uh, the devil uh, running rampant. Uh, and I, I, I talked about what they were seeing. Uh, I said, but let me tell you what I see from where I'm standing. I said, I see a congregation that runs well over a 1,000. I see a building. I see new property. I see our church as the leading church in Wichita. And I started there, and I started preaching. And uh, one of uh, the demons, I mean deacon, excuse me, 
came up to me. He was a big, tall, six foot seven uh, 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 guy. And he looked at me real mad. He said, you ain't got sense enough to pastor a thousand people. I said, you know what? You, 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 you said that to make me mad, but you are telling the truth. I don't have sense enough to pastor a thousand people. But I said, you, you actually made the wrong statement and you asked the wrong question. I said, I don't have the ability uh, to pastor a thousand people, but I am going to learn how to pastor a thousand people. I said, the question is, uh, can you be a member of a church that runs a thousand? And I don't think you can. And sure enough, two and a half years later, we had a thousand and fifty in Sunday school in less than two and a half years. Uh, let me tell you something. I believe in revival, folks. I don't care what your circumstance, oh, I feel the, I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what your circumstances are. Your circumstances are not going to stay the same. God is about to change your circumstances. God's about to change where you're standing. God's about to make things different than what you're going through. Turn to your neighbor and say, problems are not forever. Can I have an amen to somebody? I said, the problems you got today, you're not even going to remember next week. Uh, so why don't we forget about our problems tonight and let's have revival. I said, let's have revival. Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost. Praise God, I feel the Holy Ghost. You can be seen. I forget my sermon. I'm just going to preach a while. Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost. I was preaching uh, a revival in uh, Yuba City, California. And uh, when, in, in those days, uh, I preached one revival for pay. In other words, I let the preacher pay me at the end of the week. And then the next revival, I donated uh, to a home missions church. And so I was preaching uh, the revival for pay. And when I preach a revival for pay, I always do a much better job uh, than when I'm preaching free. And we had an outpouring of the Holy Ghost and that revival uh, stretched in uh, to a great number of weeks and we had several hundred people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the church tripled uh, in that single revival. That's what I believe, uh, that when God pours out the Holy Ghost, uh, you're not going to be the same. And this church is not going to be the same, uh, and the preacher is not going to be the same. Can I have an amen? And so uh, the pastor from Tulsa, Oklahoma, called me and asked me if I was coming there next. And I said, yes. I said, as soon as this revival is over, uh, I'm going to come and I'm going to preach for you uh, free of charge. I'm donating the revival to a home mission church uh, in southwest Tulsa uh, in a little house uh, that they had converted into an auditorium. Uh, and uh, there was a, 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 a field out beside the, church, uh, the little house church uh, that was there. And it was a mobile home uh, in the middle of that mode field and, and that's where I was going to stay. And so we drove nonstop from Sacramento, California to, uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma, over 1,800 miles. Uh, and we had to drive nonstop because we could not afford a, a motel room uh, and we had just enough gasoline uh, to get to Tulsa. That's how, that's how much they was paying me in that revival. And we got there and we started preaching that revival and, and the, the, the preacher and I made a deal that, that he would not take up an offering, uh, but he would not let me uh, preach without something. So I said, okay, you can take those two wicker baskets uh, and you can put them on either end of the little altar bench uh, in that little house auditorium. And I said, whatever comes in without you asking for an offering uh, will be my offering. And he said, that's a deal, we'll do that. And so the first week at the end of the revival, uh, I, I, I looked uh, on Sunday night when we got through, and there was four $1 bills uh, in the wicker baskets. And I don't know about you, but when you're broke, $4 feels like $400. And so... Uh, we went to McDonald's and, and, and my agreement was uh, that I would pay the utilities, I would leave there and I would give the pastor an offering and, uh, and, and that I would pay all the expenses of the revival. It would cost the pastor, it would cost the church nothing uh, to have that revival. 
Well, at the end of the week, uh, we got through and I walked past the, the altar and there were four $1 bills in the offering basket. And so I took them to McDonald's and I bought them a hamburger with no cheese and a small Coke. And we came back. He said, let me get the offering out of the offering basket. And so uh, we went, unlocked the door, and we walked in, and this was the first week of revival. And when we turned the lights on, uh, our eyes bugged out, our face turned blue, my eyes popped out of my head. Both offering baskets were piled up with money. And we both rushed the altar. And I said, it's mine, it's mine, <laughs> hallelujah. Jesus is mine, <laughs> and the offering baskets. And I poured out the money in the middle of the floor, and uh, at 10 o'clock that night, I counted the money, and there was over $1,400 in those two baskets. And I said, do you remember what our agreement was? I get whatever comes in the plates. But I said, I'm going to half it with you. And I gave him 700 and I took 700 Praise God. And I said, I feel led to go another week. And so I preached the second week, and people started getting the Holy Ghost. And on Sunday night, I, we started to leave the church, and I glanced, I stared, I looked, I gawked at the wicker baskets and there was only two dollars in the plates on Sunday night and we walked out and we went to McDonald's and we got a cheeseburger, a french fry and a large coke. I mean, if you're gonna stay there, let's eat higher on the hog. And we rushed back to church. Uh, we unlocked the door. We walked in to get the, uh, the two dollars out of the offering basket and they were piled up again. It wasn't just a one lump sum, but it's like you passed the offering plate at a general conference or a camp meeting. They were tens and twenties and fifties and ones and fives and coins, and I poured it out on the floor, and there was over $1,500 in those plates again. I halved it with the pastor, and I said, I feel led. Hallelujah. Woo! Hallelujah. Let's go another week. Hallelujah. And we went another week. And, and the, at the end of the third week, uh, there wasn't one single dollar came in those offering plates. And we speeded down to McDonald's. We woofed down a, a quarter pounder with cheese uh, and french fries and a large drink, praise God. And we speeded back to church. Uh, we slid up the door, put it in park, uh, rushed the door, praise God, fought to unlock that door, and the plate was filled up again. Five weeks in a row, God sent his angels to fill up the offering plate. Let me tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you have need of, but God is the supplier of any need that you have. If you need a healing, I'm gonna tell you what, folks, my God, the Holy Ghost. If you need a healing, God is here to heal. If you need forgiveness, God is here to forgive. If you need a deliverance, God is in the place to deliver you. Hang on, I take dominion over every unclean spirit that's in this room tonight. In the name of Jesus, I command every demon to be bound. I command you, devil, to release your hold on every individual in this house. It's time to have revival. I'm telling you, God is on the throne and God's in the supply and business and God wants to heal and God wants to deliver and God wants to save you. Hallelujah. You say you got faith because you're on fire for God. I hadn't always been on fire for God and I go through the same things you go through. The next week, my wife and I was in the mobile home. About two o'clock in the afternoon, there came a knock on a door. Door was in the middle of a 70 foot mobile home. They had the old mobile home steps and uh, there was no skirting on the, on the mobile home. And it was in the middle of a field of about 30 acres. And my wife and I went to the door and there was a little a guy about five foot seven. He was kind of thin. He had 
salt and pepper hair, mostly gray. He had a charcoal suit on that was kind of old. and It was not pressed real well. He had a little thin black necktie on. And uh, he was kind of dark complected. And, uh, and he looked up at me and he had a paper bag, uh, a grocery bag in his hand. He said, are you Brother Cornwell? I said, I am. He said, I have a gift for you. And uh, he handed it up. He was standing on the ground. He handed up a brown paper bag. And I reached down and I took the bag from him. I handed it to Sister Cornwell. I turned back. That lasted probably a half of a second. And right before Sister Cornwell's very eyes, Brother, Brother Stoops, I'm telling you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The man vanished before our very eyes. And when he vanished into thin air, my wife's knees buckled and she started wailing and, and, and crying. And, and it scared me so badly. I ran down the steps and, 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 and I couldn't find, he was gone. He vanished. He literally vanished, vaporized right in front of our eyes. My wife is holding the paper bag in her hand and, and she's shaking unmercifully and she's crying and she says, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what's in the sack, what's in the sack? And we took the sack in the, in the, to the table and we opened it up and there was, it looked like a, a, a freezer paper, something wrapped in freezer paper. We took the little tab off of it and opened it up and there was two porterhouse T-bone steaks about two inches thick now understand, I'm a poor evangelist. I have never, I had never eaten a T-bone steak in my entire life. The, the, the biggest steak I've ever eaten was round steak called bologna. And she, my wife, my wife, is so innocent. She's such a sweetheart. I mean, she's so gentle and beautiful. And she says, what do we do with them? It wasn't like you bought two T-bone steaks at the grocery store. The bone fragments were still on the steak. It was like uh, the man had found a cow that got hit by a car and he just took a hacksaw and, and took T-bone steaks off of him. And I can imagine, you know, somebody that, that, that stole a cow and butchered it and, and, and brought me two steaks uh, that, that's not grain fed and, 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 and not uh, uh, feed yard fed. Uh, I can imagine how tough those steaks would be. And, and, and the bone frag was still on it. it. It was not cleaned up. It was just like they had whacked them off of a cow. Or I think that's where they got them from. And, and we looked around the trailer and they had a cast iron skillet underneath the sink. And so my wife got a cast iron skillet, put it on the stove, and we grilled two porterhouse T-bone steaks on the cast iron skillet in the house. And we had a, a, a loaf of white bread and we had porterhouse steak and white bread. And we had two plastic forks and two plastic knives to eat it with, praise God. And... And I thought, this ain't gonna work, this ain't gonna work, this ain't gonna, this ain't gonna work. And I got to cutting that steak with that knife and I laid the knife down and I cut it with my fork. And when I tasted that steak, listen, I've been all over the world. Every place I go, I try their steak because I keep trying to find a steak that tastes like that steak. I have never found a steak in Brazil, in Argentina, in Peru, in Ecuador, in Israel, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Europe, in Africa. I've never found a steak that tastes like that steak. But every time, every time Sister Corm and I have run into financial trouble, every time we've gone to, into a financial crisis, all of a sudden the taste of that steak comes back to my mouth. And I realize God says, I will supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. 
My God, I'm telling somebody, you ought to be on your feet tonight because God is in this place and he's about to supply your need according to his riches in glory. Somebody shout amen. Somebody shout amen. Somebody shout amen. This is not a time to be under the thumb of the enemy. I pray against mine enemy. I command confusion of faces upon them this hour. Somebody, you can be seated. A few weeks ago, we have an African-American lady in our church that is one of the sweetest, most beautiful Christians that you could ever imagine. She hasn't been in our church too long, but she came in with a shout, and she shouts every service, and she talks in tongues. And she dances in the Holy Ghost. And she runs the aisle. It doesn't matter what she's going through. She's going to do her dance. She's got her move on. Praise God. I look around at some of you young people. Where's your move at? You need to get your move back on. It ain't time to sit here and act like a stump. It's time to move, ladies and gentlemen. You got to get your groove back on. You got to get your move back on. A while ago, when people started running the aisle, it was grandma running the aisle, and you young people were sitting there. I'm going to tell you what, it's time, young people, to get your move back on. Well, Vivian's mother was in intensive care, and she was having to stay with her mother in intensive care. They brought... A young man, 36 years old, into the intensive care that had been hit by a hit and run driver and was in bad shape, real bad shape. And, uh, and, and so Vivian walked over to the, the lady, his wife, and said, honey, you're going through a bad time right now. And, and, and the woman fell on Vivian's neck and started weeping because the doctor said there's probably not any way we can save your husband. And, and Vivian said, honey, I'm just going to stay with you. And Vivian stayed with this woman for 10 days. Even after her mother got out of intensive care and went home, Vivian stayed with this woman. And at the end of 10 days, her husband passed away. And uh, during this time, I kept going up visiting with them and praying with them, got acquainted with them. And uh, her church, her church that she was a part of forsook her. And, 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 and the husband, his family forsook her. And uh, they actually was blaming her for her husband walking out to the mailbox and opening the mailbox and the guy in the truck and trailer hit him and left him as, as he ran. And, 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 and the, everybody turned on this woman. And uh, uh, the, the church that they had been part of all their life wouldn't have anything to do with her. Uh, his family wouldn't have anything to do with her. And she was left all alone. And, and friend, when you're out there by yourself, you don't know what you're willing to do. And she was slowly watching her husband die. Her husband uh, served two, term, two combat terms uh, in Iraq uh, and two combat terms uh, in our, uh, uh, Afghanistan. He was a combat veteran in the United States Marine Corps. I mean, the, the man survived four combat tours uh, of uh, 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 Iraq and Afghanistan and come back and gets hit by hit and run driver and and, and the woman is on the verge of, of committing suicide because she said, I'm out here by myself. I don't have anybody. I'm losing it. I'm losing my husband. I don't have any place. To, I don't know what I'm going to do. 
And Vivian stuck with her, and we stuck with her and started praying for her. When her husband died, she said, Pastor, she said, we go to another church, but I can't ask them to preach the funeral. Would you preach the funeral of my husband? And I said, I said Lisa, I'd be glad to, uh, to preach your husband's funeral. And we went to the VA cemetery, and, and we preached the funeral. And, and the following week, Lisa shows up at church. And then on Sunday morning, she shows, uh, Wednesday night, she shows up at church. And, and Brother uh, Charles Robinette from Vienna, Austria, uh, is preaching for us. And she walks up to the front, and she stands there. And Brother Robinette doesn't know her from anybody. But he said, lady, God is just to fill you with the Holy Ghost. He's going to heal your body, and he's going to heal your mind. And when he laid hands on her, God instantly filled her with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. She, got, she went and got baptized that night in the name of Jesus. Can I have an amen, somebody? And then she calls her mother in California and said, Mom, you won't believe uh, what happened to me today. God has come to my rescue. Uh, I was about to commit suicide, uh, but God has come into my life. Uh, I was about to call it quits, uh, but God has helped me. I don't care what you're going through. I'm gonna tell you there's a God that will heal you and raise you up and bless you again. The Holy Ghost just fell in this room again. I said, the Holy Ghost just fell in this room again. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell somebody that there's a God on the throne that's not going to let you down. And I am positive. I'm going to prophesy again. God is about to send an outpouring of the Holy Ghost in this church, and you're going to double in one single revival. Mothers says, honey, I think you lost your mind. She said, I'm going to be on the next plane out. She gets on an airplane, San Francisco, flies to Wichita to rescue her daughter from the Holy Rollers. <laughs> and she shows up at church on Sunday morning. Brother Robinette preached Wednesday night. He's preaching Sunday morning. And before you give an altar call, Lisa stands up and runs to the altar. And she's standing there. About the time her mother comes and, and kind of pushes her over and stands where Lisa was standing. And that's the exact place where Lisa got the Holy Ghost. Charles Robinette walks over to her and says, I don't know who you are. I've never seen you before. But God told me he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Slaps his hands on her, and before he gets his hands on her, she throws her hands up in the air and gets the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And before I know what's happened, uh, they baptize her in the name of Jesus. God can take an impossible situation, and he can turn that situation around uh, in one moment of time. Can I have an amen, somebody? Now, when bad things happen, God means some good things from it. You missed it. I say when bad things are happening, God means some good things with it. Well, I got a bunch of grandkids. I got more grandkids than you shake a stick at. If I have one more grandchild, I'm filing bankruptcy. My wife gets a paycheck every Monday morning and if she makes me mad because she won't pay bills with her money. She won't pay the house payments. She won't pay the utilities. She spends her entire paycheck every week on them not headed grandkids. <laughs> and then she says, honey, can I borrow $50? She said, I'll pay you back. I said, you're lying. You ain't never paid me back a dime. For fact, in my will, I'm going to collect everything in my will when I die. <laughs> well, we had all the grandkids. I was out preaching somewhere, and all the grandkids was over at the house, and they was playing baseball in the driveway. 
And one of the grandkids throwed a baseball through our plate glass window. I still have yet to find out which one it was. Because they have swore each other to silence. I, I said, honey, who broke my window? She said, it doesn't matter who broke your window. <laughs> said, just call a contractor and have it fixed. <laughs> who broke the window? She said, you don't really need to know. And she said, all you do is fuss at them. And they're such sweet grandkids. <laughs> Makes you want to puke. I'm ready to grab them by the shirt collar, pick them up, hang them on a nail, take a rod and beat them half to death. I'd have teach them to break my windows. It was one of those windows that they have quit making. I called 10 contractors. Finally, I called a contractor that had worked for me years ago and he came out and he said, Reverend, I hate to tell you, but they don't make this window no more. He said, but there is a company over in Missouri that makes a window very similar to this. I said, similar or like, get it, just fix my window. He said, well, he said, to make it look right, the other window needs to be changed. I, I just, he was Jewish. So I had two windows put in instead of one so they'd look alike. And when I looked at the window he put in, it was just like all my other windows. <laughs> and so we stand around talking and we get acquainted. Well, three weeks later, he called me and said, Reverend, said, I got a friend. He's 36 years old and he got stage four cancer and is in the hospital. And he said, the boy's not saved and doesn't go to church he said, I, would you meet me up there and help me lead him to Christ? I thought, oh, man. You know I got a hold of some Baptist here. I said, okay. So we went to the hospital, and the room was full of people. And I got to pray with the boy, but I couldn't talk to him because there was too many people in the room. And so I started visiting Every day I started visiting this young man. And uh, him and his wife were beautiful young couple, 36 years old. And uh, I know he's a good guy because he's a coyote hunter. And he has greyhound dogs that he runs coyotes with. And, and, and when you walk in his living room, uh, all the way around his living room is deer heads. And uh, bobcats and wolves and, and uh, snapping turtles and pigs all up mounted. He's got bows and guns. Boy, this guy's cool, man. That's my kind of man. Sorry about that, wackos, but that's my kind of man. And uh, I realized his wife had to take off work, so I, I take him a bunch of money to give to him to help him through this time of, of crisis that they're in. And uh, he looked at me and he said, he said, Reverend, he said, do you think it'd be all right if I came to church? I said, you're asking me if you can come to church? He said, yeah. I said, can we come to your church? <laughs> it took me 10 minutes to, to overcome my fright. I couldn't believe. Somebody asked me if they can come. <laughs> Amen. I said, well, certainly you can come. He said, well, he said, uh, do you have a wheelchair? Uh, I said, I'll tell you what. I'll have a wheelchair waiting for you at the door. They'll put you in a wheelchair, and I I'll bring you up to the front, and you can sit right beside my wife. And, and she'll protect y'all when you come to the house of God. He said, protect us. I said, yeah. I said we have, we have a, some wild people in our church. And, and they find out you're sick. They're liable to stampede you and start laying hands on you and start praying for you. <laughs> you know, God does heal. And it says, they shall lay hands on the sick. It doesn't say the preacher shall lay hands. It says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I'm going to tell you what, if you don't want to get stampeded, don't come to the front in our church because I, I, you, you, you'll get healed out of self-defense. <laughs> and so they came and put them in a wheelchair over on the side and they didn't come by themselves. They brought four other families with them. 
they filled up the entire second row on this side, crossed the aisle, and filled up the second row on the next aisle. And guess what? The, the contractor that fixed my window that my grandchild throwed a ball through that I was going to kill <laughs> is sitting right there. And his wife is sitting right there. And, w and when Brother Robinette gets through preaching, all of a sudden, all four families uh, are standing at the altar. And one by one, all four families uh, receive the baptism uh, of the Holy Ghost. They come out of the baptistry dripping wet, praise God. I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, just because it looks bad today, God is gonna use your situation for somebody's soul. You better hear me, ladies and gentlemen. The Holy Ghost just fell in this room again. God is preparing this church for the greatest outpouring that he's ever had, praise God. Maine, look out. God is about to give Maine an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Somebody shout amen with me. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We all go through situations uh, that we'd rather not go through. We all go through sicknesses uh, that we'd like to leave out. But in the end, uh, all things work together for good uh, to them that love the Lord and are the call according to his purpose. Brother Tim, I feel the Holy Ghost falling on you right now. Just stand up and worship the Lord right where you're standing. In the name of Jesus. God is about to bless you. He is about to give you one of the greatest blessings of your life. In the name of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a sovereign moving of the Holy Ghost in this room. Whatever you have need of, you need to stand and start claiming it right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Young people, let me tell you something. It's time for some of you to get back on fire for God. It's not time to wait until the end of the uh, school year. It's time to get on fire for God right now because God wants to use somebody in his will. Hallelujah. Let's raise our hands and let's praise God. For a fact, I want everybody to come around the front. Just come around the front for a few moments. I don't want nobody hanging your head down. I want you holding your head up. I want you to lift up your hands and I want you to vocally praise God. Give me some music over here, praise God. In the name of Jesus. It's tongue talking time in the tabernacle tonight. I said it's tongue talking time in the tabernacle tonight. Come on, everybody come around the front. If you hang back, I'm going to think you've been sinning. Praise God. Come around the front. We're going to participate together. Come on, get away from that wall. Get up here close to the front. Praise God. It's time to praise God as a body. It's time to rebuke the devil as a body. It's time to demand the oppressor to leave in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Lift up your hand, everybody. Praise God. Don't give me no dead music. Give me some live music. Praise God. It's time to praise God. Everybody lift your hands. Everybody lift up your voice and praise God right now. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift up your voice. 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 In the name of Jesus, we defeat the enemy. In the name of Jesus, Satan, you're bound. In Jesus' name.